Now you know it's recording. So let me introduce, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Jordan Simon. He's an orthopedic surgeon with Northeast Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. Dr. Simon is dual board certified in orthopedic surgery and sports medicine by the American Board of Orthopedic Surgery. In addition to his position, Dr. Simon is the director of the Joint Replacement Center at Nyack Hospital and assistant clinical professor at New York University, Langone's Hospital for Joint Diseases. Dr. Simon completed a fellowship in sports medicine at Lake Tahoe Orthopedics and Sports Medicine, as well as a fellowship in orthopedic research at NYU Langan Hospital for Joint Diseases. He completed a residency in orthopedic surgery at NYU Lang Langan's Hospital for Joint Diseases, where he was honored with the Senior Residence Research Award. What an honor to have you with us today. It's really, I'm I'm thrilled and um, I was looking through your PowerPoint last night and my God, those pictures, I can't wait to share those pictures with everybody who's watching us here. So uh, let's get it started. Just a note to our attendees, please remember the chat box and the Q&A boxes are active. So please ask all your questions because this is a, like once in a lifetime opportunity to talk with a orthopedic guru about like surgery and all of this. And you might like to ask all the questions that you have as we go along. And then after his presentation, we're gonna uh, be answering all your questions. The podium is yours, the virtual podium is yours. All right, Th thanks very much, Sandra. I appreciate that uh, kind introduction. Um, so I'm gonna turn on my presentation here. Um, and uh, we'll just get started here. So, um, Sandra, can you see, you can see the picture? Yes, okay. very much, yeah. So uh, I'm gonna talk today a little bit about um, robotic surgery uh, for knee replacement, specifically the ROSA system, which is brought to us by Zimmer Biomet. And this is something that we're gonna be bringing into Nyack Hospital in the very near future. Uh, we're really just waiting for delivery of the machine and then we'll, we'll start using it. Um, I'm already fully trained on it and have done uh, multiple surgeries with it uh, in the lab, and it's a really great tool that I'm looking forward to using. Um, before I can really explain the benefits of using a robot during knee surgery, I have to explain what knee replacement is because a lot of people hear the words, but they're not familiar with it. On the left of your screen is a picture of an arthritic knee where basically there's bone on bone arthritis and the knee would be painful and stiff and cause difficulty walking. After somebody has completed non-operative treatment and they're still having pain, we elect to do knee replacement. And that's the picture on the right. This is the same knee. And what you see is we've not only put a metal implant in here, that's the white part on the upper bone called the femur and the lower bone called the tibia. There are two metal pieces and then the plastic in between. Not only have we put those pieces in, but we've also straightened the leg. And in order to do that accurately, we need to remove just the right amount of bone to put the metal pieces in, but not too much and we need to put it in the right orientation to straighten out the knee. The problem is when we straighten out the knee, there are not only bones, but soft tissues involved. On the left, you can imagine that the ligament here is gonna be shorter than the ligament on the inside. So we're gonna need to balance the soft tissues while making the bone cuts and doing all of this to end up with a knee that's balanced for soft tissues and straight for the implants. And that's something that, that creates a, a real art in knee replacement. Um, uh, some of my colleagues would say that knee replacement is really more about the soft tissue than it is about the bone. The way we, that we do it currently is we use alignment jigs, which are basically mechanical tools. We drill a bone in the, a hole in the bone in the femur and put a rod up the middle of the femur. And that puts this alignment jig on and we set it to about five degrees with nine millimeters of resection. And we make little adjustments based on a feel, but most knees are done about the same with a standard cut. And that's accurate enough to get a good result today. But as I'll show you in a little while, the Rosa does a little bit better job with that. On the tibial side, it's the same thing. We put a clamp around the ankle. We have a rod that's outside the tibia. And then we put this jig on and we adjust it left and right, in and out to get what we think is gonna be the right cut. And after about 20 years, I can get this pretty accurate, but it is still a, a pretty uh, inaccurate way to do things overall. That brings in, robotic surgery. 
What we're looking at here is the Rosa. On the left of the screen is the actual robotic arm that's gonna assist in surgery. On the right is actually the, the brain of the device here, and these are the eyes. And this device up on top that I'm circling actually watches the surgery, puts the data into the computer, and then that gives feedback to the robotic arm so that everything works together. The, the robot really doesn't see the knee. The robot sees what are called arrays that we attach to the bones, and it uses that with a computerized model uh, in order to know what's going on during the surgery and how to place these implants. It's really impressive technology. Um, the way that we feed the data into the robot is with, an, with a very specialized x-ray. These x-rays are taken with a, a device on the outside of the leg in a very specific orientation and these, are, these dots and these pins that you see are markers that will be used to create a three-dimensional image out of the two-dimensional x-rays. One of the advantages of, of this particular robot is that you don't need a CAT scan or an MRI like some other robots. They can actually take these x-rays and translate them into a three-dimensional model. Once we have that model built, we feed it into the computer. And in this particular case, this patient has a crooked knee of 6.5 degrees and we made a plan to straighten it to two degrees. Ideal would be zero degrees, but sometimes we cheat in order to allow uh, for less disruption of, of the soft tissue balance. The computer allows us to do the operation in a virtual space in the computer before we even touch the patient. So this would be what a pre-op plan looks like. And we know that we're gonna be taking 10 millimeters proximal resection here, 10 millimeters distal resection, and all this stuff can be played with to get the best result before we've even entered the operating room. Once we're in the operating room, we put on the arrays that I spoke about. These are these little devices attached to the leg, and we use little pins to put those on, and they attach the bones, and then we register the knee. And what that means is the computer watches the movement of these arrays as we go through a specific range of motion and it records the soft tissue uh, laxity on either side. So for instance, on this picture on the bottom of the screen where the surgeon is moving the knee side to side, what's happening is the computer is registering how much movement we get from side to side with stress. And it takes that into account. So it builds a model not only of the bones, but also of the soft tissues. Then before we make any bone cuts, we look back at the computer and we can make adjustments to how much bone we're cutting on either side of the knee, what angle we're cutting it at, um, and what kind of soft tissue balancing we're gonna have to do, again, before we've even started the operation. So we're currently, we make the bone cuts first and then we work on the soft tissue second. This allows us to do everything simultaneously before actually doing the operation. So we know that we can make adjustments in the bone cuts to minimize the soft tissue imbalance or vice versa, and that's a very powerful tool. This is what Rosa looks like on a saw bone. This is obviously not a real bone, but artificial, but I wanna show you what it looks like when it's in action. And basically, the surgeon controls the robot. The surgeon moves it into, into place, and then we would pin it there and make a cut. Then we move it down to the tibia. Again, the surgeon is gonna move it into place, and we make a cut. So all movements are controlled by the surgeon. The, the robot itself stays on plane, meaning you can move it around in three dimensional space, but it's still gonna maintain accuracy of the cut. And that's to allow you to work around the soft tissues because even though this looks very clean here, in real life, there's soft tissue in the way and you need to come in at the optimum angle. But the ROSA allows us to move around the soft tissues and still remain in the plane of the cut. So this is what it looks like. We've brought ROSA in we've pinned the cutting block in place, and then the surgeon makes the cut like he normally would. Currently, this block would be pinned in place with, with manual instruments, but here the ROSA has brought it in and put it exactly where we want it based on the preoperative templating, so we know that we're getting an accurate cut. The surgeon still controls the saw, and again, one of the things I like about this particular robot is the surgeon is in control at all times. The robot is not doing the operation. What the robot is doing is it's assisting the, surger, the surgeon in placing these cutting blocks in a very precise way that has been planned out to take into account not only the bone, but the soft tissue. So that was the, fem the femoral cut. This is the tibial cut. And the next one is what's called the distal femoral uh, cutting block placement. 
And again, this is very important because not only is Rosa guiding us front and back, left and right, but also it's controlling rotation. And that's based off of all the calculations we did before. This is a pretty good view of the pins that we have to put in for those arrays so Rosa can see what we're doing. Once this is pinned in place, the next step is to put this cutting block on. And this is the exact same cutting block that I currently use without the robot. It's just been guided into the optimal position before I, before I pin it in place. And then I make the cut just like I normally would. After we finish making those cuts, we can check with Rosa's assistance, the range of motion and the laxity of the knee. And this knee, let me go back, sorry. On this knee, it's two millimeters and two millimeters in extension, which is perfect. Three millimeters on the outside, two millimeters on the inside in flexion, which is also very good. So this is a knee that we'd be happy with. The surgeon also can feel what's going on and the surgeon can feel what's going on and basically judge how well the knee is balanced based on his experience and use the data on the screen to confirm that. Uh, as of today, we do all the same things, but we're doing it without the, without the digital feedback. Uh, so this leads to better accuracy. Um, the ROSA system is, is the system we chose at NIAC for multiple reasons. There are other robots out there. The thing I like about this particular system is it's surgeon-centered. The robot is not doing the operation. The robot is helping the surgeon make better decisions and more accurate uh, placement of the cutting jigs, but the surgeon is still doing the operation, and, and I think that's very important. It's very accurate. The data shows that this is accurate within one millimeter and one degree of the plan. It's efficient because we don't have to do a, a special MRI or CT scan. We can use regular x-rays to make, to make the three-dimensional model. There's also something called imageless surgery where we don't even have to use the pre-op x-rays. We can make those calculations during the surgery if for any reason the x-rays weren't available. Um, and a lot of surgeons after using this, I'm told, will switch to the 3D modeling right to the imageless case option. Um, so it does give you more, uh, more flexibility here. Um, and this is data driven. What that means is during the surgery, we're seeing actual numbers, objective criteria for, for where we make our bone cuts. We can then use that data to look at our post-op uh, results and see what correlates with a good result and what correlates with a, with a uh, less than optimal result. And by collecting all that data over time, we'll be able to use artificial intelligence. And instead of the robot just assisting us in making what we think are the right cuts, the robot, the robot through a database will tell us for any particular patient what the optimal cuts would look like to get them the best result, not only based on making things equal and accurate, but based on real life outcomes. And that's one of the things that's very exciting about all of this data-driven uh, equipment. Um, no longer are we saying, well, I think this is the best way to do it, but we'll have before and after data to figure out the optimal way to do things and we'll be able to do it precise within a millimeter and a degree. So this is a, a real leap forward. Um, I'm very excited to bring this to, to Nyack Hospital. Um, I'm hoping to, to start using it at the hospital within a month or so. Um, and uh, I think it's a great tool to use. Ultimately, the end result is what matters. And whether you use a robot or you do it manually, a well-done knee is going to be a well-done knee. Um, I don't want people to think that, well, if you don't use the robot, you're not gonna have a good result. The surgeon's skill and the surgeon's expertise still is paramount. This is a tool that the surgeon can use to, to optimize the outcomes. But even without a robot, patients are still doing well. But I, I think that we can make those results even better and, and more uh, precise with, with this new tool. So uh, I'm happy to introduce it uh, you know, to the public here and uh, hope to be using it in the very near future. Thank you, Dr. Simon. And I hope you weren't looking at my faces because I was just like, you know, because I, I'm not a very good friends with blood and stuff, but those graphs were amazing. So before we start getting questions from uh, our attendees, although they are starting to come, I have a few questions. Sure. When is this surgery recommended? So Total knee surgery, whether you use a robot or do it with manual techniques, it's the, the recommendation is the same. And it's basically when your x-rays show severe arthritis and when your symptoms warrant going in for a, uh, you know, for a surgical procedure. 
um, most patients will go through non-operative treatment first, starting with medication, physical therapy, activity modification, progressing to things like injections. Um, and when they've gone through all of that and they're still having a lot of pain, then we would consider knee replacement. And how long after you have the surgery are you able to walk again? What will be the recovery time? So we get patients out of bed the same day. If a patient has surgery yesterday morning, yesterday afternoon, they would have walked already. And that's standard for all knee replacements. Um, that does not change with a robotic knee or a, or a standard knee. Um, patients will still be expected to get out of bed the same day with physical therapy. And a lot of our patients now are going home the next morning and they're recovering at home, usually for about two weeks with a therapist visiting them, uh, usually three or two or three days a week at home. And then after two weeks, they go to outpatient therapy. Full recovery from a knee replacement is somewhere eight to 12 weeks on average. Um, but patients are up and around the same day of surgery. Wow. Okay, so that's walking. What about biking? Do well, you mean biking, like 12 days later? Uh, most patients are not going to get, they might get on a stationary bike somewhere around two weeks when they start working with physical therapy. But to be on an actual bicycle out on the road, um, I would say, you know, you're probably looking at at least six weeks. And it depends, again, on the patient. There's a, a wide variability in the rate of recovery for patients. And, and that not only has to do with the surgery, but it has to do with the patient's status before the surgery. And that's why we, make, we recommend that patients be in the best shape they can be in before surgery, which means home exercise beforehand. Mm -hmm. So now I, I know a few people who have had this knee replacement surgery and they complain of a lot of pain. Like what's up? Uh, protocol here in, in Montefiore Nyack about pain, you know, either before, during, or after surgery? So when we do the surgery, we usually do what's called a regional block. And that's a, a nerve block that uses a long acting anesthetic. So even after the anesthesia from the surgery wears off, they won't have much pain, at least, you know, until maybe the next day when that block wears off. So the long acting block allows patients to be more comfortable immediately after surgery. Then we have the anesthesiologists who use what's called multimodal pain therapy. So they'll use things like intravenous Tylenol, oral medications, some narcotic, and basically a cocktail of different medications to control the pain while trying to keep the patient from getting all the side effects of heavy duty pain medications such as nausea, vomiting, drowsiness. Mm -hmm. The goal is to control the pain, but keep the patient awake and alert so they can be active and recover quicker. That's great. So sounds to me like patients can be confident that their pain is gonna be treated and it's gonna be manageable and they don't have to be as scared of the pain, correct? Abs absolutely. I, I will tell you, years ago, I used to say to patients, this is a very painful operation and you, you gotta be prepared for that. Now I can confidently say, well, there's always going to be some discomfort after surgery, but we're much better at managing the pain today than we were 10 years ago. And, and I am pretty, uh, I'm pretty impressed at the, the, the degree of comfort patients will have even the day after surgery. Uh, it is a remarkable difference compared to just 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. oh, that's great. And is uh, Rosa used for, for hip surgery as well or just for the knee? So Rosa right now is only indicated for the knee. There is a hip application coming out. There are other robots that do assist with hip surgery. I'm not convinced that the advantage on a hip is nearly the same as the advantage on a knee. The difference between hip and knee surgery is knee surgery is very, uh, very reliant on the soft tissue balance. And the way that you make the cuts can be varied significantly based on that. And the, the, I, the ability to be able to integrate the soft tissue information with the bony information in real time as you're doing the surgery can lead to a, a much better outcome on a knee. On a hip, the soft tissue is not nearly as variable and there's not a lot of variation in the way you align the components. The optimal alignment is the optimal, optimal alignment. So if you have a, a good eye and a lot of experience, a, a total hip, with the robot versus without the robot is not gonna be very different. Um, but they are working on an application for those who prefer to use it. Again, my, my excitement is really on the knee side 
Um, when the hip comes out, I may or may not choose to use it because I think that there's less value because that operation is a little bit more standard th than the knee. But okay. obviously opinions will vary and there are robots available now for hips. So now that we're talking a little bit about the comparison between you know, the regular surgery and the robotic surgery, what will be some of the differences for the knee and advantages? So the, the, there's really not a lot of disadvantage to using the robot for the knee. The only disadvantage I would say is we have to put in those four little pins. So it does lead to a couple of extra little scars. And theoretically, those little pins going through the bone could create what's called a stress riser, which makes a slightly increased risk of fracture through those pin sites. But again, one of the benefits of ROSA is the pins are very small on the ROSA, smaller than some other systems. So there's less likelihood of, of sustaining a fracture. That's really the only potential downside of using this system. The upside is, again, because you're working on soft tissue balance and bone cuts simultaneously before you actually make the cuts, you don't end up chasing your tail during surgery. In manual surgery, you make your bone cuts first, then you have to adjust the soft tissues to match the bone cuts. And sometimes you end up in a situation where you've made your bone cuts and the soft tissues are out of balance. And then you say, well, if I had cheated a bone cut a little this way or that way, I wouldn't have to do as much soft tissue balancing, but I've already made my cuts. So now I have to just work on the soft tissues to catch up. In the Rosa model, you do all of that in virtual space first. So by the time you actually start cutting the bone, you know how much imbalance you may have, and you're not gonna be, again, chasing your tail, trying to catch up on the soft tissues because the bone cuts were not optimal. Um, again, it's a, it's a newer concept. I've actually incorporated these concepts into my manual surgery based on, again, years of experience, um, where I'll cheat a little bit one way or the other when I make my bone cuts in anticipation of the soft tissue. Um, but it's gonna be a lot more accurate to do that with the data from, from the ROSA in real time. Um, and that's really the biggest benefit. There are companies that are trying to sell their robot saying that, well, patients will have less pain after surgery. Um, I'm not sure that using the robot or not using the robot is gonna to lead to any more or less pain. But I will say that if the, if the knee is better balanced with the soft tissues, the patient should recover quicker than somebody whose knee is out of balance after surgery. Um, so even somebody who may not have the best results today with their manual knees, the ROSA can help them improve the results. And somebody who already has good results can put in those outliers so that instead of having 98% of patients in, in, the, in the range that we want, maybe we can make that 100% of patients. Um, so just the, the accuracy and the consistency of the robot, I think, you know, makes it valuable to use with very little downside. So just a reminder to our attendees to please write your questions either in the comments box or the Q&A boxes. Uh, but in the meantime, I have another question for you. So if you have already had a knee surgery and you're not happy with the surgery or it didn't go the way it was expected, can you then have a second surgery with the robotic surgery? So that's, that's called a revision knee replacement. And right now, uh, the current robotic surger, surgery platforms are not set up for revision knees. Um, any revision knee is going to be done with manual instruments. But I do know that the ROSA system, because it's x-ray based, has the advantage of being able to um, adapt to revision surgery much more than those other systems that are CAT scan based. If you try to do a CAT scan after knee replacement, it, you may not be able to get a clear enough image to load into a, into a robotic system. But because ROSA is x-ray based, it will be feasible to use the ROSA for the revision system. And in fact, the, again, one of the advantages here is the system that I use through Zimmer Biomet called the Persona, it has a very robust revision system so they will be uh, employing the revision system with ROSA, hopefully within the next year, so that that will help us with the revisions as well. And that, that's a huge uh, benefit because revision surgery is much more in intricate than primary surgery. 
and and the data that you get from the ROSA will will help tremendously in improving those outcomes. Mm -hmm. And one of our attendees is uh, saying that I was told the replacement parts only last 15 years. Does this surgery do anything to extend the part life? Um, it's an interesting question. Theoretically, if the if the knee is in optimal alignment, it should extend the lifespan of the knee replacement, theoretically. Um, but there are some cases out there where you see a knee that was done 10 years ago, it's not in good alignment, and you take an x-ray and it looks perfectly fine. And you see patients with knees that are perfectly aligned and they wear out at 10 years. So it's not all just about alignment. And I would like to say, oh yes, the robot's gonna optimize the alignment and therefore they're gonna have better longevity, but it's really not fair to say that for sure until we get there. The bottom line is most knee replacements actually last more than 15 years. We use 15 years because that's when we start to see some of them wearing out. But the vast majority of patients who have a knee replacement, their knee will last more than 15 years and will likely last them their lifetime. Um, it's really the younger patients where we worry about longevity. Okay, and let's say that I wanna have a surgery like a, a robotic knee surgery here at Montefiore. Do I have to request an appointment with a particular doctor or all the doctors in the orthopedic department are going to be able to perform this surgery? How does that work? So um, all of the doctors who are currently working uh, at Nyack Hospital um, are interested in using the robot. I cannot say that everybody is going to want to use it all the time. There are certain patients where they may choose not to use it. Um, so I would say that it's a question to ask your surgeon when you're in the office, you know, are you going to use a robot or not? Again, it is not, a, it, it is not the end-all be-all of surgery. It's a tool that the surgeon can use to improve outcomes. But if a surgeon chooses not to use the robot, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't consider that surgeon. Um, the vast majority of surgeries done throughout the country now are not robotic and the outcomes are still good. It's just another tool in the armamentarium. Um, but most of our surgeons at NIAC are interested in using the robot. Um, we, we are trained on another robot already that's in use at another hospital. Um, but I think that there are advantages to ROSA, which is why we chose the ROSA robot for NIAC. So, you know, in short, uh, robotic surgery is not new to, to me or my partners, but the ROSA system is new to NIAC and, and that's the tool that we're, we've chosen to, to use. So now I, I think I've heard you a few times saying you chose the ROSA. So are there other robots there that do the same thing? And then if so, why did you choose this particular one? So um, there are definitely other robots. Um, there are three or four others that come to mind. Um, and the reason that, that we chose to use ROSA at NIAC was it, it, very multifactorial. Number one, the ROSA allows us to continue using the implants that most of us are using, specifically Zimmer Biomet. Zimmer Biomet, uh, they're two companies that merged together and we've been using their implants now. I, I personally have been using their implants for 20 years. Um, ROSA allows me to continue using the same implants that I've been using. Uh, the persona knee is a relatively new knee that's been out for maybe two or three years. It has a lot of options, a lot of bells and whistles, and it's probably the most advanced knee system available uh, today. So the ROSA is compatible with that system. It's also compatible with the older Biomet uh, Vanguard system. It's also compatible with the, um, with the older Zimmer line. So you have choices on your implants. On top of that, ROSA allows the surgeon to remain in control. The surgeon still controls the saw. The surgeon can look at the cutting block placement before he makes the cut. And again, know from experience, it looks right, it doesn't look right, and you can manually check it because sometimes robots can make mistakes. You know, we say with computers, garbage in, garbage out, right? If the input to the, to the system isn't valid, then the output from the system isn't valid. And sometimes you look at the robot and you say, mm, I don't like that and you'll make a manual adjustment. With other systems, there are no cutting blocks. You don't get that preview. You just have to trust the robot. And the robot actually is controlling the saw. The surgeon's hand is on the saw, but the robot is telling you where that saw is gonna go. And 
for me, that's a big leap of faith in technology. I, I still want to have the last say in where that cut's going to be made and how it's going to be made. And the Rosa allows you to do that. The Rosa is never in control of the surgery. Um, and then the last thing is, is just familiarity. You know, we've been working with Zimmer Biomet for a long time. It's a great company. Um, I've, I've known about the Rosa for probably about 18 months now. Um, I've trained on it. I've been to other uh, hospitals that have it in use. And it just, it doesn't interrupt the flow. It's still a total knee. It's just a tool that comes in to help us with it. Other robots are a little bit more invasive. They really kind of take over. And as a surgeon, you're kind of holding on to the handle but everything is being controlled by the system. And for me, I, I want to be in control of that, of, of that operation. And the ROSA allows me to do that. And the last thing, last thing, ROSA is x-ray based. CT scans, MRIs, it's an extra expense. And um, some of the insurance companies will push back on paying for that extra study. ROSA doesn't require that. It's x-ray based. And that means that we don't have to worry about insurance paying for extra studies and we can get the x-rays in the office. You don't have to make a special trip to a, an MRI or a CAT scan or for a CAT scan. So a lot of advantages to this system and, and we're re really looking forward to using it. And this last point actually brings me to one of the questions of our attendees. Is this surgery covered by insurance? Absolutely. The, whether it's robotic or manual, it's still billed the same way as a total knee replacement. And I know of no insurance company that does not cover knee replacement surgery. Some of them have requirements that you must have gone through conservative management first, and they may deny surgery if they don't see evidence of conservative management. But if you're properly indicated for the surgery and you've gone through the conservative steps and you are a good candidate for the knee replacement, all insurances to my knowledge do cover knee replacement surgery. Beautiful. We have another question. It is true that a, is it true that a robotic assisted knee replacement can result in more natural feeling after surgery? Um, I think the, the, the response to that is a well done knee will feel more natural than a knee that's not well done. And mm -hmm. if you use a robot to get to that point, it's going to feel better. If you do it manually, it's going to feel better. The end result is really what matters. And the robot can help guide a surgeon to that end point with a little bit more accuracy. But you can get to that same point manually. I think that there are, again, marketing campaigns that push that idea that a robotic knee is done more accurately. And because the soft tissue balance is going to be more accurate, it will feel more natural. And I, and I would agree with that statement. I think you can achieve that same end point manually. So really what we're looking for is we're looking for a knee that's properly aligned and well balanced. And the, rob the robotic tools allow us to get there more consistently. But a knee replacement is still a knee replacement whether they use the robot or not. Now you were talking about, um, when you were talking about the advantages of the robotic surgery and specifically the ROSA, and also during your presentation, you were showing how before the actual surgery, there is like a virtual surgery where you kind of, you know, plan everything before the surgery to make sure that the surgery is exactly the way you want it to be. Now for that virtual uh, pre-surgery that you're planning, does the patient need to be there? Is, how is that done? So basically we take the x-rays in the office and the patient obviously needs to be there to get the x-rays done. Then we send those x-rays to Zimmer Biomet. They use a, a program called Atlas X to make that 3D model. That 3D model is then sent back to me and I take my computer and I do all the preoperative planning here in the office. The patient does not need to be there. That creates the basic model to start with. The soft tissue analysis is done during the surgery. So we take that basic model that I've made preoperatively and we put that on top of the soft tissue data that we collect during the surgery where the patient's obviously there. Um, and then we make our final plan intraoperatively. 
So the patient does not have to make any special trips to the office for that preoperative planning. That's all done in the background. Even today, we do preoperative planning for knee replacement, but it's not nearly as intricate. And it's basically just based off of a two-dimensional x-ray with a, with a computerized overlay to see sizes, but it doesn't take into account any of the soft tissues. So uh, bottom line is there's no extra effort on the patient's part other than taking the, the calibrated x-ray here in the office. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, you know, my background is dietitian, so I'm always asking about food. So after the surgery, can the patient have like a regular diet? Is there something specific that they need to follow in regards to food recommendations, food intake? Um, not really my field of expertise, but we put patients back on a regular diet the evening of surgery. Okay. And is it true, I've heard that there is like a special menu for patients uh, after they've undergone robotic knee surgery? So, well, it's not just robotic knee surgery, but at NIAC, at NIAC, Montefiore NIAC, we do have a program where patients will enjoy a celebratory meal the night before they're discharged, um, where there is a, a special menu, you know, fan, a fancy menu. Um, but that's, you know, that's, again, not really medically based. It's just something we do for the patients to make them feel, you know, that they've, that they've achieved their goal of having the knee replacement and they're on their road to recovery. Okay, that, that sounds yummy to me. It's good, it sounds yummy to me. And now we have another question here. I am 52 and I need a double knee replacement. My doctor said I need to wait at least 10 years because the parts don't last long. I was hoping that I, will have to wait, that I wouldn't have to wait so long to get the surgery. What do you think? I think you need to get another opinion. Um, I've done knee replacements in patients in their 40s, 50s, 60s. I've had patients in their 90s that I've done knee replacements on. Um, we do recommend that patients try to hold off until they're older because we don't want to do multiple revisions. If we assume that the knee replacement is going to last 15 years, at 52, you could be looking at a revision at 77. But that's not necessarily true. You might have a knee replacement that lasts 20 or 25 years. The bottom line is you should have knee replacement when you're ready. When you failed conservative management, when your x-rays look bad enough, your level of activity has decreased because of the knee replacement and you and your surgeon agree that it's the, the right next choice and, or the right next step. Um, it should not be based on the fact that you're 52 and you must wait 10 years. That being said, if your x-rays don't look that bad and your arthritis is not that painful and you're only 52, it may be beneficial to wait a little bit longer, but you have to take it on a case by case basis. I would never say to a patient, you're 52, you're too young. What I might say is you're 52 and your arthritis isn't that bad, you should wait until it gets worse. But again, it's an individual discussion. And certainly if a surgeon said you should wait 10 years because it may not last that long, you might wanna get another opinion to see if in fact your, your surgeon is being too conservative. Wouldn't it make sense to get the surgery earlier because youth will give you an advantage on like healing time and you know other issues as opposed to you know being over 70 or 80? So that's a matter of opinion. Um, there are definitely doctors who say you know don't wait too long because it'll compromise your results. Um, again I look at every patient as an individual and I want to I want to take the patient to the OR at the optimal time. I want them to have a good range of motion because they'll be able to maintain it easier post-op than somebody who already has stiffness. But I don't want to take somebody to the operating room too soon where if their pain is a three or a four out of 10 and you take them to the operating room because they want the operation, they're not going to be happy with the surgery because the pain after surgery is going to be more than they had before. And then when it quiets down, they might say, well, my pain was a three or four before surgery, but now it's still a one or a two. I don't feel that much better. If you take that same patient and you wait to the point where they say my pain is an eight or a nine out of 10, and then they have the surgery and they feel a one or a two out of 10, they say, wow, I feel so much better. And they really appreciate the result. So I try to find that optimal time where the patient's pain 
is bad enough to justify the surgery, the x-rays are bad enough to justify the surgery, and they've failed those conservative measures. Um, so it really is a, a, a very individualized decision when you proceed with knee replacement. And what about the parts and that issue about the parts not lasting as long? So in the past, the, the reason that knee replacements wore out is because the plastic wore down and the little plastic particles would cause inflammation in the knee would, that would cause the bone to dissolve and loosen up, something called, we call aseptic loosening. The newer knee replacements now, what we're seeing is the failure mode is not the plastic wearing out. It's actually the bone becoming a little soft and then the, the metal pieces loosen from the bone. And that's because the plastic has gotten better. So we're not really seeing failure of the implant as much as we're seeing failure of the host bone. And that's occurring later. So um, when we say that knee replacements wear out, that, that kind of, that's historical now. They're not wearing out as, as early. And when they do wear out, it's really not a failure of the implant, but it's more a failure of the host bone in a patient who may be developed to, into believe that the longevity longevity um, will know for sure as time goes on. Okay. So, uh, and, and this person continues to ask us some questions. So even if you haven't lost all your cartilage, car help me Dr. Simon, cartilage. cartilage. Thank you, <laughs> cartilage. You still can have the surgery, right? You don't have to wait until you have lost it all. Or what will be your recommendation? It sounds, it really sounds like this patient needs a, an office visit. Um, yeah. I, again, I, I am, I, I am admittedly a more conservative surgeon. So I do try to have my patients hold off until their x-ray appearance justifies the surgery. But there are some patients where the x-rays don't look that bad, but we know that the cartilage is damaged. We know that their pain is severe. We know that their activities of daily living are compromised. And those patients you might consider surgery before the x-ray looks like it's bone on bone. But my personal bias is towards trying to wait on those patients. Um, I, do, I do find that patients that have surgery prematurely don't have as high satisfaction as patients who wait until the surgery is, is really necessary. But again, it's an individual discussion that you have to have with your surgeon and you have to take all the factors into consideration. Okay. Now we've been talking a lot about arthritis, but are there any other causes to have knee replacement? I don't know, like an injury or something like that where robotic surgery can be used as well? So it's very rare to do a knee replacement for injury. Um, there are some rare cases where we have a very elderly patient who has a, a fracture of the end of their femur bone and the bone just isn't reconstructible. So you do a replacement, but that's a very different situation than, than what we're talking about here. Um, some patients will have an injury that will lead to what we call post-traumatic arthritis, where the arthritis is not because of wear and tear, but it's because of one specific injury. But even then, that would be years down the road from the initial injury. Um, in, in, all of, in all of those cases, it's still treated as an arthritic knee, and you can still use the robot for that. Sometimes you have some deformity from the injury, and the robot can be very helpful in managing the alignment because of the prior injury. So in those cases, the robot is a very useful tool, um, especially if, say, you have a patient who had a fracture that didn't heal quite straight, and you want to do a knee replacement on that patient. With, ma with manual instruments, it's very difficult, but the robot can work around that pre-existing deformity to find an optimal result. So in that case, it would be very helpful. Mm -hmm. And we have another question. Dr. Simon, I have zero pain, but after sitting for a while, my knee is so stiff, it takes me a while to be able to walk. Would you consider surgery? Uh, again, that's a patient that I would first want to see the x-rays, examine them, and see what non-operative treatments have, have been tried first. Uh, there's a lot that can be done for that condition without surgery. Um, if, they're, if they've exhausted all their non-operative options and that's their only complaint, 
I would probably be very careful about surgery, but I wouldn't rule it out because that is, if they're having trouble getting up and getting going, sometimes that's enough to justify knee replacement. But you have to go mm -hmm. through the non-operative steps first because that patient may be well served with some good non-operative treatment. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that physical therapy is one of those non-operative treatments that are often recommended for these situations. Now, a lot of people work, they don't have the money to do the co-payments, the time to be attending, you know, three, four visits per week. Um, so if people don't complete a, a whole treatment of physical therapy, they will not be eligible for surgery or is there a way to skip that? So it, it, you don't need to go to a physical therapist to do physical therapy. A lot of this can be self-directed home physical therapy. We, we actually provide patients with a guidebook before surgery that has exercises to be done pre-op and post-op. They're actually detailed in the book and we encourage patients to do the exercises on their own at home. Some patients need a little bit more direction and those patients would benefit from going to formal physical therapy. But many patients can do most of the exercises on their own, even if they had to go to therapy for one or two visits, just to learn the right techniques, they can do it. Others might find it better just go to a physical therapist twice a week. I do find post-op, it is important to have hands-on physical therapy for most patients because the knee is swollen, it's sore, it feels stiff, and the therapist helps them push through that to get the range of motion back. So pre-op, I think that you can do a lot of it on your own. Post-op, I do like to have a physical therapist involved, but even then, there's a lot that you can do on your own as well. Okay. Well, thank you. I don't, I don't have any more questions. No more questions are coming. Any final thoughts, Dr. Simon? Uh, listen, I, I appreciate you having me you know, on the community chat and uh, I look forward to bringing the ROSA to NIAC. Um, you know, as I said, knee replacement is a, it's a great option for the right patients, but it's very important to make sure that you've had a thorough discussion with your surgeon, that you've had appropriate conservative management first, and then when the time is right, the patient is usually going to be the first person that knows that it's really time to proceed. And, and that's when the surgeon, you know, will, will give the final say. Um, and, you know, I look forward to, to using this tool in the future at NIAC. Okay. And if our patients want to reach your fantastic team of orthopedics, um, and orthopedists and nurses and everybody else that is in the team, how can they reach out to you? So um, there are multiple ways. Um, they can go to the Montefiore NIAC website. There is a page for the Joint Replacement Center and there's contact information for our surgeons at that website. Um, there's also the Northeast Orthopedics and Sports Medicine website uh, where you can find myself and, and my partner's uh, contact information. Um, and, and those are probably the two best ways to, to get in touch with surgeons that work at Montefiore NIAC. Okay, so I'm writing this in the community, in the chat box. So you go to the Montefiore Nyack Hospital and you look for the Joint Replacement, the joint replacement Center. Center. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you said something else. And the other way you, you can go to the Northeast Orthopedics and Sports Medicine website, which is uh, www.neosmteam.com. Dot com, and then you can go to physician profiles and see all my uh, partners on that website as well. And they can just Google your name because you're pretty famous because you were the first person to come up when I Googled your name. So <laughs> that wouldn't be that hard to find you. Okay, perfect. Okay, well, thank you again to you. I learned a lot. As I go, every Thursday is my favorite thing to do because I learned so much. And thank you to all of our attendees for being with us. Thank you for your questions. Uh, if you feel that you still need more help, please reach out to us, either to my department or the information that I just uh, put on the chat box. And we'll see you next week. Thank you, Dr. Simon. Okay, thank you. Bye, everyone.